Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for our free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here today continuing my discussions with Larry Swedro, who is head of financial and economic research at Buckingham Wealth Partners. You can learn more about Larry's story. He was episode 645. Now, Larry has a deep understanding of the world of academic research and investing, and especially risk. Today, we're going to discuss a chapter of his book, Investment Mistakes Even Smart Investors Make and How to Avoid Them. And today, the topic is mistake number one. Are you overconfident of your skills? Larry, take it away. Yeah, so there's a lot of research showing that human beings, it's an all too common trait that we tend to be overconfident of our skills. And it's regardless of the type of question you ask. So for example, there have been studies uh, that have looked at asking this question, are you a better than average driver? And of course, we know the answer, if you do enough people, should be 50% would say better, and 50% should be worse. But the answers come back typically more like 85% are better than average, which of course is impossible. We don't live in Lake Wobegon, where we're all better or most of the people are better than average. Uh, and we get the same answer if you ask people, are you liked by others more than the average person? Are you a better lover than the average person? It doesn't matter uh, what the question is. The answers tend to come back that a vast majority um, think they're better than average. Now, that's actually a good, healthy thing when it comes to being a human being because imagine getting up and looking in the mirror and seeing uh, that person and then saying, I'm dumb, ugly, stupid, and nobody likes me. The suicide rate would be through the roof, all right? So it's good to feel better about yourself as long as you don't make mistakes. And in our daily lives, we tend not to make that. For example, you might think that you're a better than average driver, uh, and that might cause you to drive at 80 or 90 miles an hour on an empty freeway in the middle of a perfectly sunny afternoon, and you'll probably be okay. But that overconfidence probably would not cause you to drive that same 95 miles an hour in a busy city street in a downpouring rainstorm with 50 miles an hour wind. Your brain would take over and moderate your overconfidence. So what does that have to do with investing? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, all investors make up the market. And if some investors are going to outperform, that means some investors must underperform. You have to have victims to exploit. Well, if we're all, or most of us are overconfident, we think we're a lot smarter than the average person and we trade, we're gonna be able to exploit them. And the evidence says, of course, that that's dead wrong because you're not competing one-on-one. -on -one. If Warren Buffett, for example, is competing with me, picking stocks, he's probably gonna outperform me. But Warren Buffett today is competing against Renaissance technology and Citadel and all these high frequency traders. And the academic research has caught up with Buffett and has uncovered you know, all of his secret sauces and reverse engineered them. So for the last 20 years, if you bought stocks that Warren Buffett told you to buy, meaning cheap, profitable, high quality companies and screen for them, the way professional fund companies like Dimensional, Avantis, uh, and others do, Buffett has not generated any alpha in the last 15 years or so. Hold prior on, to that, that's he just generated sacrilege, Larry. Yeah, that's sacrilege. sacrilege. I went back and looked at his record, and one of the things I could see is that 
if he hadn't had such a good performance in the 70s, mm -hmm. he probably wouldn't even, he wouldn't even know his name. He'd just be another really good, you know, good fund manager for sure. You know, uh, but well, he did pretty well right up until the academic research caught up with him. So the problem is the, uh, the evidence shows, for example, that the average stock bought by individual investors goes on to underperform after they buy them. And the average stock they sell goes on to outperform after they sell them. That's not exactly you know, what you want to do. And, you know, the thing is they have to recognize that when they're trading, today, 90% of the trading is done by the Goldman Sachs's and Morgan Stanley's and Citadel's and Renaissance's and all the high frequency traders who have massive amounts of databases, high tech computers, uh, they most of the people managing money there are world class mathematicians or scientists with PhDs in finance. What are the odds you, the amateur investor, are going to be able to outsmart them? And every time you buy a stock, the odds are ninety percent, roughly, that the person on the other side is more skilled than you. So why are you trading? Why do you think you'll have an advantage? Now, it's even a bit more interesting, and the women listening to this call will appreciate this, that women, their stock picking skills, interestingly enough, are no better than the stock picking skills of men. The stocks they buy do just as poorly as the stocks that men do, and the stocks they sell go on to outperform. Yet women have higher returns than men. Andrew, you want to... Tell us why you think that's the case. Well, they're, they're, they they trade less. They have less confidence, maybe? Yeah, I think it's the, what I would call the testosterone factor. Mm -hmm. Men have confidence and skills they don't have. Women simply know better. Uh, they don't overestimate their skills as much as men do. And so they trade less, so they have less turnover costs. And so they end up getting better returns. What's interesting, though, is that married women do worse <laughs> than single women because they get influenced by their men and married men do better than single men because they have the influence of their sage spouses. Yeah, I so think that's- There's a, the, some good the, examples. The, the words from your book are, the obvious explanation is that single men do not benefit of the, sa the spouse's sage counsel to temper their overconfidence. <laughs> Let me ask you a question about the overconfidence um, bias, because one of the problems that it's, it's, it's an intellectual difficulty for many people to see is that, so when we say that the average person thinks that they're um, you know a, a better driver, let's say, the question that people would ask when we when we go into this is they'd say, so, so, so is what you're saying is that what I do really has no impact? I mean, if I, like my father, as an example, worked for DuPont all of his life and DuPont sent him to driver training because he was driving around for selling all the time and he was a very safe driver and does, does doesn't hard work and training and knowledge produce outperformance? Well, uh, in general, of course, uh, the more knowledge you have, the smarter you become. But the problem is that the, the difference is the game of investing is very different than say the game, let's use an example of tennis, where you're playing one on one. All right, Roger Federer is probably the greatest tennis player of all time, or maybe now some people would say uh, Jokovic might be the best player of all time. But interesting, Roger Federer, the, maybe the greatest player ever, had never lost, to my knowledge, a single match in the first round of a Grand Slam tournament. That's pretty amazing because he's playing against not me or you, <laughs> okay? He's playing against one of the top 128 best players in the world, and yet he never lost a match. Clearly, they're thinking about their skill sets. These are some of the greatest players. So they're so much better than you and I. You and I might play with one of them. We would never win a game, maybe never get a point. 
against them, or not many, and yet Roger Federer beats them every single time. Because when you have one-on-one -on -one matches, whether it's tennis or chess, small differences in skill lead to huge differences in outcome. Now, as Federer went through the rounds, and you have to win, I think, six matches to win a Grand Slam tournament, of course, his winning percentage would go down because the competition got tougher. So as the competition gets tougher, becomes harder to win, and luck becomes more of a determinant. Even if Roger Federer wasn't feeling particularly well one day, didn't matter. He was going to win that first round match. But he better be at his absolute best playing against Nadal or Djokovic, right? When we're playing a game of investing, we're not competing one-on-one. -on -one. We're competing against the collective wisdom of the marketplace. That's a much different competitor. And that's why Warren Buffett today even has a very difficult time. As we said, the research, and I published it in my most recent books, he hasn't generated any alpha in about 20 years now uh, because the academics have caught up with him. Uh, reverse engineering allowed them to figure out what types of stocks to buy. So we know today, for example, Buffett's skill was not picking individual stocks or mm. timing the market. It was identifying the traits of the types of stocks to buy, which he was telling people for decades what they were. And once you identified them, then fund families like Dimensional, Avantis, and others simply said, we could buy all the stocks that have these characteristics, and they have, in fact, generated the same types of returns without any statistically significant difference that Buffett has generated. Now, that doesn't take anything away from Buffett's genius, of course, but the world caught up with him. And the mistake that people make, I'll add, is they think they're playing a game of one-on-one, -on -one, mm. and maybe if they're trading against me or you, they may be no more, but they're not. And the second mistake that's related is, let's say they're doing research on a company, and then Jim Cramer comes on TV and gives them 15 things about some company that he's touting. Their management is great. Their balance sheet is great. They've got all these great new products. And so you decide you should buy that. Now, whenever I hear somebody telling me they want, they bought a stock, I ask them, tell me why. And I'll say, let's assume for the moment, I agree with all of your ideas. All of your reasons to buy are correct. And then I tell them it's completely irrelevant. And the reason is, I ask them very simply, are you the only one who knows this? Having heard this, by the way, on national television or read it in Barron's, which tells you no before the markets know, which is about absurd a uh, marketing uh, tool as I've ever heard. Uh, and, you know, that's the problem. You know, if you're buying a stock for these reasons, you could be sure the smart people at Citadel and Renaissance and Morgan Stanley and Goldman know every single thing you do. And if they don't, it's likely it's inside information. And Martha Stewart found out what happens when you trade on that and make money. That's the problem. They're confusing information with value-added information, meaning stuff nobody else knows, or somehow you can interpret it better. And the average person doesn't have value-relevant information. And they're competing against the collective wisdom of the market, which is a much tougher competitor than one-on-one. -on -one. And here's the analogy yep. I will use to help people think about it. Maybe the greatest hitter of our generation was Albert Pujols, probably is the greatest gender. Now imagine, here's Who a guy he? who hit, sorry? Who is he? Albert Pujols was the best major league baseball hitter for okay. the last 20 years, he just retired. He batted over 300, he had the best first 10 years of any hitter in history. Now imagine Albert Pujols 
as a batter, and I excuse the reference if you're not familiar with baseball, is imagine he was facing a pitcher who had Randy Johnson's fastball. He had the fastest fastball of any pitcher. Sandy Koufax's curveball, which is the greatest ever. Hoyt Wilhelm's knuckleball. Uh, Greg Mattis's changeup, all in one pitcher. That's the collective wisdom of the moment. He would probably have hit 180, not 320. That's the problem. It's like, to use a tennis analogy to be more familiar, imagine Federer having to compete against a player who had, let's say, uh, you know, a Jokovic return to serve, and erotic serve, uh, the be whoever the best backhand, the doll is the best backhand, he had the speed of the greatest, you know, athlete. Federer could not beat that person, mm. but, but he's not. It, he's playing one-on-one -on -one against individuals. When you trade, you have to understand you're competing against the collective wisdom of the market with each investor providing their input to help prices come to what, it's called the best estimate of the right price. Nobody knows the right price, mm. but the market's price is likely the best estimate of the right price, which is why so few active managers are able to outperform on a persistent basis. Um, there's a couple of points I wanted to ask about, but, but before I do that, I just tell a story of when I started in the stock market in 1993 in Bangkok, Thailand. You know, every single broker had the trading floor, you know, it was all, you know, right there. Nobody would do it by online. And so, uh, but what was fascinating was that it was like grandma and grandpa would come down and all of these people would just come to the trading floor. They'd bring their lunches and their pails and stuff. And they'd sit in front of these boards where they were flashing lights and, you know, all the, the quotes going on and you could see them, the excitement in the room, particularly when the market was booming, Right. Uh, in, in 1993, when I started in the stock market in September of 1993, by 1994, January, stock market had just doubled in Thailand. So it was on fire. But what you started to realize as I spent time in those trading rooms was that a lot of those people thought they were trading against each other. Yes. Yeah, you know, and they're kind of like, oh, I won this time. You were selling that and I was buying that. And I always try to tell them like behind that number. Are you know, there's a million people out there looking at that one stock, you know, and you don't even realize it. But, you know, when I was a young analyst, I went traveling all the time to visit fund managers around the world. And I went to talk about Bangkok Bank because I had done a lot of research on it. And I talked to a guy in New York and I'm, I was like telling him all about it. And I said, uh, I asked him, he said, yeah, I've held Bangkok Bank for a while. And I said, how do you get your information? He says, I call the chairman. And I was like, okay, he held it for like 20 years and he has a direct line to the chairman and he's sitting in New York. And I'm just thinking that myself that most people are think that they're trading against, you know, it's, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one or a smaller when, thing, but whenever it's you buy, I tell people, whenever you buy a stock, you should stop before you execute and ask who's on the other side of the trade. And there's an old saying at, about poker players, right? If you don't know who the sucker is at the table, you're it. And since we know that 90% of the trading basically is done by sophisticated institutions who hire world-class mathematicians, scientists, uh, and who have PhDs in finance and investing in massive computer power and all this talent, they have much more access to information than you have. Do you, are you really seriously going to say you know more than they do and are more likely to be right? And if you answer, you know, with humility, the answer is probably going to be no. So then why are you trading? So one question now, if you is, want to do it as an entertainment account, yeah. you know, I you know, people go to Las Vegas and they maybe put $500 or a thousand and they're willing to lose it and for the pleasure of going and, being in company and try to beat the house or go to the racetrack, that's fine. But you don't take your IRA account or your retirement account, wherever it's called, wherever you're an investor, to the stockbroker's office because he's likely to be one who's confiscating, you know, your assets, transferring so, them from your pocket to his. One question is, 
uh, based upon the research that you've read and looked at and, you know, the things that you've seen, is this, uh, is it, is it just, it just got a lot harder over the last 10 or 20 years as big institutions have computing power and the big brains. And if you go back 20 years or 30 years that you could have outperformed? Well, I wrote a book, which I'd urge your listeners uh, to read, called The Incredible Shrinking Alpha, co-authored with a good friend, Andy Birkin, who, by the way, is a PhD in physics and head of research for a major investment firm who manages billions. So that's, an, and he won the NASA award for best software of the year. So that's who the kind of people you're competing against. So in the book, I point out four key reasons why it's actually gotten much harder and present the evidence. So I'll give a, a brief uh, little uh, synopsis of the book here. I wrote my first book in 1998. Around the same time, Charles Ellis wrote his famous book, uh, Winning the Loser's Game. Yep. So what he meant by that is you can win in Las Vegas at the roulette wheel or the craps table, uh, but the odds are against you. And the surest way to win a loser's game is don't play. Mm. When Ellis wrote his book in 98, 20% of the professional fund managers were beating risk-adjusted benchmarks in a statistically significant way before taxes. If you're a taxable investor, because taxes, at least in the U.S., are the biggest expense of active managers, more than their trading costs, more than their expense ratio, then that number was probably half that. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like those odds playing with money I want to yeah. retire on. So Ellis called that winning the loser's game. You're better off accepting market prices using index funds or similar strategies and pick the assets you want to invest in, the risk factor. So if you want small value stocks instead of the S&P, you don't buy the S&P 500, you could buy the S&P 600 value index. So you decide which risks you want and then invest in that in a systematic, transparent, entirely replicable way. And how does that get over the tax costs? Because there's very little turnover, so that makes it more efficient. Yeah. And today with ETFs for every type of index fund or other systematic strategy, their ability to wash capital gains uh, means there's virtually no distributions. What does that mean, Today, to wash capital gains? So what happens is there are what are called approved participants in that market when they go through redemption and creation. And these, what they do is they can, when they distribute out stock, they can give it to, say, a charitable institution like Yale's endowment, and it's their low basis. They don't care that, all right? So they just got rid of the capital gains from the fund. Mm, okay. They redeem in kind instead of selling, just give the share. So that's a simple explanation and allows them to wash the capital gains out. Okay, system. so just to review, uh, you were saying <clears throat> you wrote your first book in 1998. Charlie Ellis came out about... Um, <clears throat> about his book and talking about uh, the loser, basically, ultimately, it's a losing game. And at that time, 20% of fund managers were beating their benchmarks before tax taxes. But after tax, it was maybe half that because yeah. tax is a huge cost. So, uh, and so it's interesting, today, time, the Thai market, along with some other markets around the world, are tax-free. There are no capital gains in the Thai right. tax market, but that's still, you know, other other factors uh, so so over time, now, what does it look like today? Yeah. So today, that number, several studies, in fact, as early as 2010, Farmer and French wrote a paper called Luck versus Skill. Uh, they, they found that right around 2% of active managers were outperforming their risk of just, so just within that 12-year period. There was another paper in 2014 uh, and that found the same thing. Uh, Morningstar has published plenty of stuff, et cetera. They're, the evidence is very clear. And the reasons are, as I go into great detail and present the evidence in the book, number one yep. is that 
the academics have been very busy what was once alpha opportunities and converted them into beta, which is just a systematic trait or characteristic that's replicable. We talked about this with Buffett. So prior to the 1980s and right around 1990, the only operating model we had for asset pricing was the capital asset pricing model, CAPM, which only was able to explain about two thirds of the differences in returns of diversified portfolios. So it meant there was huge opportunities to generate alpha. Along comes a bunch of researchers and they found two characteristics that added explanatory power. One of them was that small stocks outperform large stocks. Okay. And the other was that cheap stocks outperformed expensive stocks. So we now had two other factors called size and value. And Farmer and French are often given credit for discovering this, did no such thing. They just wrote a paper summarizing that research, put it into a new model called the Farmer French three-factor model. And now we're able to explain about 92% or so of the variance in returns of active managers. So only 8% was left. Now, what's important here- That 92% that that was just those two factors or you're saying now plus, with additional plus factors? Plus the market beta, plus market beta. So yep. you have the three. So the important thing is this, prior to Fama and French publishing their paper in 92, you're an active manager, you could buy cheap stocks, value companies, low PE, low price to book, whatever metric, and claim outperformance. And over time, we know value stocks have outperformed. So in most years, about two thirds of the time, uh, value outperforms. In those years, you claim alpha. Well, you can't do that anymore because I could own an index fund of value stocks and get that exposure. So you have to find the value stocks that outperform now, much harder than just buying value stocks. And you used to be able to claim out performance by buying small companies. Can't do that anymore because you have a benchmark there. Then Mark Carhart comes along in 97 and he summarized further research by Jagadish and Titman, which found a momentum factor, which was that stocks that had outperformed in the recent past, six months to a year roughly, have a tendency a bit more than half the time to continue to outperform over the next short period on average five, six months. So mm. now active managers used to be able to claim alpha by buying positive momentum stocks, avoiding negative ones or shorting them even. Can't do that anymore because yeah. I can own a momentum yeah. fund. All of the fund families that I invest with incorporate this research. Then in 2013, Robert Novi Marx writes a paper on profitability. This is taking along on Buffett, if you will, saying you should buy more profitable companies. They've outperformed. Well, prior to 2013, you could claim alpha by buying more profitable companies. You can't do that any longer. And, uh, and more recent, one last bit of research, uh, Cliff Asness and the team at AQR combined profitability with other factors that are related uh, that Buffett had been saying, you shouldn't just buy profitable companies and cheap ones. You want to buy them where their earnings are more stable. They don't have a lot of financial leverage. They they're a quality company. And now we have a factor called QMJ, which is quality minus junk. So you go along the quality stocks and short the junk ones. And so all these opportunities are gone mm. because all of the fund families like those of Avantis Dimensional and many others, BlackRock, now incorporate that. So the opportunities to claim alpha shrank dramatically. We now can explain more than 95% of the variance of returns just by telling me what stock types of stocks you own, I can virtually 
guess your performance without knowing which of those stocks with those characteristics you own. So, so, so that was the first. And that, let's thing. stop at the first one for a second, just for the yeah. listeners out there that may not get all this. I'm going to try to summarize the the what you've said. And the first thing I think that's most important is that, let's say before we had a lot of financial innovations where it was easy to set up ETFs or these types of funds, uh, in the old days, basically, an individual could become an expert in small cap stocks and that they didn't know, nobody kind of knew officially that small cap stocks tend to outperform large cap stocks. And therefore, that person could claim that they're producing on the overall amount of money that they have, that their stock selection strategy, if you didn't know what they were doing, even their stock selection strategy was superior to just owning all the stocks in the market or the index. And so they appeared to be that uh, outperforming. Now, what the academic research says, is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, there's there's a persistent uh, outperformance or risk-adjusted return outperformance for small cap well. stocks. What was that? You're getting a premium for taking either, for most of the time, you would certainly say small stocks are riskier, just like stocks are riskier than T-bills. No one would say you're generating alpha by buying stocks and you beat treasury bills. That's a premium, historically about 8% or so on an annual basis, about 7% on a compound basis. That's a premium for taking risk. And the outperformance of small stocks is a premium for taking risk. Now, unless you beat an index of small stocks, that's not alpha anymore. And that the point is, is that now that there is a, all the innovation in the financial world over the past 20 years or so, basically anybody can invest in small cap stocks in mass, and therefore anybody can capture that alpha, or they may actually cause the alpha to disappear. Yeah. Uh, they, well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we'll diverge for a minute and come back to the other three points. If there's risk, and everyone discovers that small outperforms, that premium might shrink because more money is chasing small stocks. Mm. But it should never become a negative premium in a logical world in the same way that stocks should never logically have lower expected returns than T-bills because they're riskier and no one should buy them. That doesn't rule out the possibility of bubbles. And you know we get them on occasion, uh, and because of what are called limits to arbitrage, sophisticated investors can't fully correct mispricings. Mm. The way you correct the mispricing is you go in and borrow a stock and sell it, going short, hoping to buy it back later. The problem with that is there's unlimited loss potential. Right. So you could be right in the long term, but if you're wrong in the short term, you get a margin call. And if you can't meet it, you have to put up more capital. Then you get called and you're out. It's exactly what happened to a hedge fund when the Reddit crowd uh, got them on this GameStop episode. Uh, and GameStop, which was vastly overvalued when he shorted it at probably like 60, the short squeezed them and the stock went up to like, 450 or 600 or somewhere before it eventually collapsed again. Mm. So this Melvin guy, this hedge fund lost 4 billion, even though he was right in the long term. So people are fearful because it's expensive to short and you have the potential for unlimited losses. If you go long, you can only lose what you put in. Mm. But when you're short, there's unlimited losses. And that's what prevents sophisticated investors from fully correcting prices. So we can have bubbles from time to time. We had the dot-com bubble. We had another bubble appearing with all these disruptive, innovative companies hmm. like Kathy Woods bought, and they eventually imploded. Eventually those things go away. Can we talk again about the small cap? Let's just focus on that for a second, because when you talk about small cap, um, you mentioned about uh, risk-adjusted return versus just return. And the question that I want to make clear so that the audience understands the difference here 
if we talk about small cap stocks and we look at the performance of them over a long period of time, as a whole, they tended to outperform. However, are you saying that they also outperform when adjusting for risk or nope. don't outperform when adjusting for risk? No. Uh, here's a way to think about uh, this. A smaller cap stocks have had higher returns, but a lot more volatility and they suffer bigger crashes. They're illiquid. They cost more to trade. You should demand a premium for that type of risk. And they become even more illiquid in crises. And when you go to try to sell, there may be no bids and you may have to take a big market impact to sell. And that's so, all risk. Yep. And so as an as a as let's just say I'm a I'm an asset owner, I go to that fund manager that's managing a small cap and he's going, hey. I'm outperforming the market. I've been doing that for years with my small cap strategy. And what I should be asking him is, wait a minute, are you exposing me to a lot more risk in order to get access to that higher return? Or is that higher return coming at market risk? Well, here's an easy solution for all your listeners. You don't have to ask any questions. There's a wonderful free website called portfoliovisualizer.com. Uh, and you just enter the name of that fund, you have it run a regression to tell you what risk factors it was exposed to, and it will spit out whether they're, once you adjusted for their exposure to these factors like size, value, momentum, quality, uh, and then it will show you whether there was any alpha there or not. And what and you'll find is in the vast majority of cases, there is negative alpha. And um, I'll include that in the in the show notes. I'm just looking at the site right now so people can check it out. But let me ask you, if you saw that somebody did outperform according to Portfolio Visualizer to say, in other words, that let's just keep it simple by saying small caps, that they were overexposed to small caps and they did better than the small, on a risk-adjusted basis, they did better than the small cap right. index. right. The next question is, was that because of luck or was that because of skill? That's right. That's a very difficult question. And it's hard to know without having like 50 or 75 or 100 years of data. And here's why. Think about, let's imagine we're in a room with 100, or let's take it as a stadium uh, for a World Cup soccer match. So you got 100,000 people, right? Mm. And let's, we'll have a coin flip contest. And we're gonna say heads wins and tails loses. So they flip and we would expect, and although we know the number won't be exact, that 50,000 will, will win. So that's round one. Round two, 25,000 have flipped heads twice in a row. Round three, 12,500. Round four, six, two, five. You're down 10 and maybe you've got two or four people left, whatever, right? Mm. Would you attribute that to skill, the people who won? Would you bet your retirement account on that? Well, let me let me answer that by talking about, I had a, a, a group of 2,000 people I spoke to in the Philippines, young people, and I got them to do that exercise. Except in this case, I said, if you get a heads, you're a winner. If right. you get tails, you're a loser. And then I had them do it until we did it, 10 flips, you know, and we got through it. Right. And then I had them, the, the, the winners and the losers get up on stage. And then I asked them how they did it. And, and we were laughing because some of them said, I, you know, I, I rubbed the coin, I said a prayer. And so they were even attributing their, what we can obviously say was luck. They're attributing it to some kind of impact that they had on it. But yes, we would attribute that wholly to luck. Right. And that's, so that's the problem. Today, you have over 10,000, there are more funds then there are stocks by a huge margin, right? And you have not only 10,000 or so mutual funds and ETFs, but more than 10,000 hedge funds, right? And so when you have so many people playing, the odds are purely randomly, somebody will beat the market 10 years in a row. And it might just be luck. And people can't accept that, but that's the reality. Uh, and that's why you do statistical tests. 
and Fama and French, I mentioned this luck versus skill paper, when you run the test that way, they found that less than 2% of active managers were generating statistically significant alpha. So the alpha was big enough to say with let's say 95% confidence that it was skill, but there was still some chance it might've been luck. Now, so if you had a hundred years of data, you might be 99% confident. And so, and also it's not enough if somebody's looking at the stock market and they see that person statistically show out performance. It's not enough to tell, tell me, uh, and they've done it for five years. No, we need to see much more data. That's what you're saying in you order to be to able to- see it much more. Let me give you some examples. So in the 70s, if I had to ask you to guess who is the best mutual fund manager, one name should pop up. Peter Lynch, who was it? Peter Lynch, but that's the wrong answer. He was only the second best fund manager. Forgot the guy's name, but the fund was called 44 Wall Street. Hmm. In my book, I talk about this. So right. You might find I just name escapes me for the moment. Hmm. The next 10 years, Lynch went on to become famous, right, as a great manager. And while the market soared in the 80s, 44 Wall Street lost 73%. So you wait 10 years. Okay, it can't be locked. This guy's better than Peter Lynch. I'm going to give him all my money. You missed out on the great returns. And then you got horrible returns. Mm. So it's likely that he wasn't a genius who suddenly took a stupid pill. He was just lucky and got unlucky. And it's very hard to differentiate between Lynch and him. Let me give another great example. Uh, Bill Miller is a name many people will read. He yep. beat the S&P, I think it was, like 15 years in a row. The first guy to ever do it. Now, randomly, we should expect somebody to do it, but he was the first to do it. So money flows in, right? Everyone, you got to get him to match. And then the next decade, whatever, his returns were very poor. In fact, he got fired as a fund manager, left, you know, and so this is very common. Mm. And a problem is this, as we talk about in the incredible shrinking alpha, one of the problems is successful active management contains the seeds of self-destruction because <laughs> to beat the market, you have to look very different than the market. And when you get a lot of cash, you either have to diversify, you get a lot more assets or your trading costs go through the roof because you're buying large blocks of a small number of stocks. Which is, which so, is, which is dealing with an issue that some people will say is that, oh, I've got a straight trading strategy that's outperforming. Right. But can it be done at scale? That's right. And right. that's the problem. Scale is a negatively correlating figure related to asset manager. And I think so, you're talking about David Baker, by the way. David Baker. Yes, that's the name. Thank you. All right. So let uh, we can okay, move so that, on. That's I'll number one. To, What's number that's two? number one. Number two, the competition's much tougher. When I got out uh, of my MBA program, was one of the first MBA programs in finance because there was no financial theory until the late 60s with the Cap M. There, if you were taking finance courses, it was probably in an accounting or economics uh, degree. Uh, I went through one of the first in the late 60s, early 70s finance programs in my undergraduate and graduate school. Today, so people who are managing money were not finance majors. They didn't know financial theory. They didn't have the knowledge we have today. Today, everyone managing money knows all of this stuff. And they are a lot smarter, as I mentioned. They hire world-class scientists. The competition's tougher. Yep. And there's something called the, uh, the paradox of skill. When the tougher the competition the harder it is to differentiate yourself. So what I talk about is that fact that in baseball, the kind of the standard, the toughest thing to do today is to be a 400 hitter. Now, no one has done it since 1941. That's 80 plus years. 
but it was done 11 times in the prior 40 years. But the problem is today, why are there no 400 hitters? When today's athletes are bigger, stronger, faster, better regiments, better diets, better drugs, playing against those that better players. performance. Sorry? They're playing against those better players. Yeah, that just as the batters have gotten better, the pitchers have gotten better, the fielders have gotten better, the gloves have gotten better. The, in 1900 <clears throat> to around 1940, the, the uh, standard deviation, batters averaged about 250 to 260, but the standard deviation was over 40. Mm. So there were big differences. So it it didn't take a huge, you know, amount of this, you know, you know, you would be three or four standard deviations away and you would be a 400 hitter. One standard deviation got you to 300, 200 to about 340, three got you to 390 or 380, and then the fourth you're up there, right? Today, the batters still average that same 250, 260, but the standard deviation is under 25. And that's now because information need... that people know that if some someone's swinging in a certain way, they see it and then, or they're practicing in a certain way and then the, the, the next club just picks it up and starts doing it or what? Yeah, well, the competition's just tougher. It's like I said, it's tougher for Roger Federer as he walks through a tournament and wins matches. By the time you get to the championship, he doesn't win more than about 55, 60% of the time. Okay, so you could say so, over time, you know, in, you go back 50 years ago, there was a small number of people that collectively have been trading markets. Right. But as time goes and their record is shown and people see the public information about it, more and more people are entering the game. And now information is beginning to be more narrow and understood. And it's then not that more people are playing the game. It's that smarter people are playing the game, more informed people. As I said, right. when I graduated, no one running money had a PhD in finance or very few. They didn't have high speed computers. Today, the head of research uh, at Dimensional mm -hmm. Fund Advisors is an ordinarical engineer. The head of research at Avantis is a nuclear, you know, is a rocket scientist. Yeah. I mentioned Andy Birkin at Bridgeway. These are much smarter people who also have better training in finance than the people who ran money in the 50s. So they're competing against each other, making it harder to be a 400 hitter, making it harder to outperform by a wide margin. And that's why you don't see people doing what Buffett did. All so right, here's, number three. Yeah, so just very quickly, in my book on the Incredible Shrinking Alpha, we show the dispersion of returns of active managers over time. And the dispersion is going like this. So when that's how you can tell that skill is getting better because it's harder to diff. The worst dummies get booted out, right? They fail and no one will give them money, right? The, and so smarter people remain. And that's like Roger Federer going through the tournament. The poor traders, poor managers are leaving, leaving the remaining players being tougher skilled and harder to win. So number competition is, is, not, is tougher as number two and the dispersion of returns reducing uh, over time is great evidence to support that. What's number three? That, exactly. Three is you need victims to outperform, right? Because outperforming even before expenses is a zero sum game, but trading and fund expenses aren't free. So you it's a negative sum game. So you've got to have dummies to exploit. Who are the dummies? Are they the institutions or retail money? Mm. In theory, it's supposed to be retail. Well, that's not theory, it's fact. Okay. We know that. We already talked about uh, the individuals, the stocks they buy go on to on average yep. underperform. Yep. Right? And the stocks they sell outperform. In 1945, coming out of World War II, 90% of all stocks were held by individual investors in their brokerage accounts. That means they were doing most of the trading. 
There was only 100 mutual funds in the US in the 1950s. Today, those numbers are completely reversed. Most of the trading is done by institutions. So that means when you're trading, you're likely trading in the today against Renaissance technology or Citadel or Morgan Stanley, where in the 40s and 50s, you were trading against some other naive investor. So retail so had been channeled, more. retail investors have been channeled into the funds that are managed by the smartest people and the, yeah, the, and the people what happens informed. even among the professional managed funds, the ones who have poor performance, money leaves, they fold and they disappear. They go to the mutual fund graveyard in the sky and the remaining smarter players get more money. So now as we get back to the second point, you know, who are the people who are going to drop out? Not the ones who were winning the game, the most skillful, the dummies, the losers drop out. So now the competition keeps getting tougher and tougher and tougher. It's like Roger Federer walk going through a tournament and winning. His odds of winning get tougher. The last point is this. The supply of dollars shrinking those, uh, sorry, chasing those shrinking pool of or sources of alpha has grown dramatically. When I wrote my first book in the late 90s, there was 300 billion in hedge funds, the most sophisticated in theory investors. Today, there's over 5 trillion, 17 times the amount of money when the sources of alpha are shrinking because the academics have converted it into beta. It's no wonder it's becoming harder and harder. Is this court number four? That's number four. The supply of capital chasing it. Now, that's the only one of the factors that could change because people could say, hey, the returns to hedge funds have been god awful for the last 20 years as the supply increased and the sources of alpha shrunk and the competition got tougher. Hedge funds had great returns in the 80s and 90s. Mm. But then these forces changed the game and they've been awful for 20 years. And the Barely 5 trillion that you're mentioning people. is hedge funds or fund management in general? In general, but I use hedge funds as an yep. example. Yep. But today you have 10,000 mutual funds and we had 100 70 years ago. The mm. amount of money chasing those shrinking sources of alpha. All and the other things, uh, those first three trends, I don't think are going to change. They're gonna get more difficult for creating higher hurdles. The last one could change as investors decide eh, we should give up this game, more of them give it up, and the supply shrinks creating less of a supply issue. The problem is the other things continue to get tougher and tougher. And what one last question I have about this, and we're gonna we're gonna wrap up in just a second, but um, <clears throat> what does it imply about, let's take Renaissance as an example, let's take Dimensional as an example. Um, does this mean that they end up accumulating all the assets over time? Or does the same thing happen to them that's happening to everybody else in five or 10 years? They're not going to be as fancy and as big anymore. And another, you know, another group is going to rise or what, what what's the prediction there? Well, uh, let's see if we can answer it uh, in the best way here. So Renaissance, for example, had the greatest track record of any hedge fund in the world mm. when they were managing a small pool of the founder's money and stuff. And then they started taking outside capital and they were so successful using quantitative strategy. They were not hiring PhDs in finance, but world-class mathematicians. And they paid super amounts of dollars for the fastest computers with the quickest pipes to the exchanges so they could get ahead of and trade one millisecond faster than you or I. And that gave them a big advantage. Mm. So they could make pennies on billions of trades and pull profits <clears throat> out of the market. They then were charging as much as like five and 50%. So 5% mm. fees, 50% of the returns. Incredible. They brought in so much money, the returns to investors were actually poor and they gave it back. And now they, I think, manage pretty much only their own smaller pool of money. That shows the problem. 
I think what you're likely to see is the shops that are purely systematic, meaning they go after unique sources of risk and then buy all the securities in that universe, they will continue to gain share the way Vanguard has gained share, the mm. way BlackRock and their iShares have gained shares, mm. uh, market share. And that's going to be the trend. They will continue to get bigger and bigger as more people go into the systematic passive strategies. And a few active managers who are continuing to be successful will likely continue to gain market share. And that will create a problem for them because the only way they'll be able to continue to generate alpha is to stop taking assets because otherwise they get too big. They have to either diversify or their market impact costs go up. And how many managers do you know that will turn down the chance to earn higher AUM fees? That's, a, that's why many, that's why Peter Lynch knew it, the game was up. He had gotten mm. so big, it was going to be very hard to generate alpha. None of the successors he hired to replace him, who were all trained under him, were able to replicate Lynch's performance. It's successful active management contains the seeds of its own destruction. And I think what you are explaining is maybe we could call it exposure investing, where if it's a small cap attribute that you want, you're going to buy a, a particular strategy that's getting exposure to that rather than trying to outperform that little narrow thing. So instead, the simple way to say it is you might buy the S&P 600 value index. So you're buying small value stocks. You own all 600 in a market cap weighted way. Where an active manager would say, we're going to pick the 100 best stocks from that 600 list. And we're going to outperform. We don't want to get average returns. Mm. And that's the myth. Act, uh, indexing does not get you average returns. It gets you market returns, which by definition gets you better than the average returns because it's a negative sum game to all of the an active small value investors in aggregate. So if somebody outperforms even before expenses, someone must underperform even before expenses. So and you're guaranteed <clears throat> to be a winner if you're a passive systematic investor. And ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up mistake number one. Are you overconfident of your skill? As you can see, Larry has a wealth of knowledge and experience. Anything you would leave the audience with in relation to this mistake in our discussion today? Yeah, well, I think the one thing I would mention is, of course, you shouldn't be overconfident and related to that is don't make the mistake uh, of confusing information, which is something everybody knows with value added information, which is something either nobody else knows or somehow you are able to interpret it better. And if, if you don't ask that question, you are likely to be overconfident and you think you can outperform when the odds say you're not likely to be able to do so. Boom. And that's a wrap on another great discussion about how to create, grow, and protect your wealth. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.